Our scripture reading that I will be preaching on comes from Acts 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out on my spirit, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved." This is our reading from Holy Scripture. As always, we ask that God aid us in our ability to live according to it. Pentecost is one of those times when churches have flames blowing. Wear red, if we remember and do other things to commemorate the fire of the Spirit. I've chosen today to not do such a heavy layering on of the fire in solidarity with our neighbors in Canada who are uh, recovering from that horrible fire there and for the residents of California who almost on a daily basis have to uh, deal with some sort of fire. Fire may be a roaring flame of coals ready to grill. I recently had my first dinner hibachi style. I'm sitting there unbeknownst that a show was about to start. A lot of clanging on the edge of the grill and then all of a sudden flames. Not just little flames, great big flames. It made me actually jump back in my chair. Fire still that has a positive reason for being. There's also fire that is destructive, like the wildfires in Canada and the ones in California and other places throughout our West. There's another part of the Holy Spirit, and that's the wind. Wind can be a gentle breeze, like yesterday as it was sunny, and then it can get into being a roaring wind when the storm moves in. I don't know if you had it here, but in Hampstead we had quite a roar of wind, and I have lots of limbs down to show the effect of a high wind. The gentle breeze is something that we appreciate, especially if we're out 
running a race and getting hot, and we want a little air to cool us down. The expectations of both the fire and the wind are that they will stay within normal constraints where we expect them to stay. But expectations have a way of being either very joyful or very fearful. Either we anticipate or we dread. The expectations in a Pentecost service is a service like this where people gather to hear the word of God and where even if you don't have red on the outside, you have red blood running through you, so you're counted in the red. But what is God's expectation of this Pentecost Sunday? And what is God's expectation of the Pentecost that happened so long ago that keeps flying through the years? A man that I like, liked, I think he's gone now, wrote a book, Who's Coming to Dinner? He was a bishop. And he wasn't writing about, you know, strange people showing up for dinner. He was talking about a ministry that he had during the Second World War. He was Dutch. And his reason for being his Pentecostal fire was to take in the Jewish folks who were being rounded up and annihilated by Hitler's group of people. He would keep them safe in his house, feeding them, tending to them, getting them what they needed, and then hopefully finding a way to get them out of the area. Well, as all good deeds eventually happened, it came to an end when somebody turned them in. And in the, in the darkness one night, they heard a sound of heavy boots and the loud, impatient knocking on their door. They were arrested and loaded into a cattle car to be taken to one of the notorious death camps. All night long, this pastor and his family rode in heartbreaking anguish, jostling against the others who had been picked up and who were jammed into that cattle car. Their expectation was death. They were stripped of any dignity, absolutely terrified, and they had heard what goes on in the extermination camps. Finally, the long night ended and the train stopped and the doors of the train were flung open and the sun came pouring in into their face. They were escorted off the train and put into lines and they knew that their expectation was about to come true. But instead, God's expectation, the Holy Spirit's expectation was freedom. They realized that somewhere along the route, someone very courageous took their own life, put it in danger to switch the track that the train was on. And they were in Switzerland. Not only were they free, but they were in a country that recognized their freedom. Instead of being marched to death, they were welcomed to new life. This gift came as an unexpected bonus. And that's what the Spirit does for us often if we let him. In the midst of our own despair, in the midst of troubles that we see no way out of, the Spirit can come in and open doors and new life in a way not possible, at least not how we saw it. So let's go back to the disciples. If you're in a room and all of a sudden fire starts raining down on you and a rush of a mighty wind comes along and you don't see the dove right away, your first reaction is human. You are afraid. And then came the incredible gift of the Holy Spirit and their new life was gifted. Flame shaped like a dove coming down 
in the midst of those flames to bring new life, new purpose, new strength, new hope. And it poured out on them not what the disciples had expected at all, but what the Holy Spirit expected. Silence in the middle of the roaring winds of Pentecost. I was thinking about Pentecost when um, I was trying to figure out um, how do we know when things are going well? When we think things are going well? Well, there's two ways to know. If things are going well, there's a lot of peace and quiet. You ever know that? Nobody's yelling and screaming. Nobody's writing nasty notes. It's just peace and quiet. And on the flip side of that, if things are going well, there's a lot of noise and commotion. This is especially if there are children in the house. So that silence and that noise go together. Within both the noise and the silence are the reassuring signs and sounds of communion and connection. In a life of faith, They're both days of noise and days that are dampened down. In a life of faith, Christ appears to us both as the mighty rushing wind and as the still small hush of the winged doves. And it's in both places that we hear the voice of God, that we experience the Spirit of God, that we are motivated by that spirit. The same God who grandstanded a pillar of fire by night and a cloud of smoke by day to the Israelites as they were leaving Egypt is the same God who came in a still, small voice that spoke to prophets as they prayed. Jesus spoke to the multitudes, preached a huge crowd, prayed thankfully for food that he did not yet have in front of a crowd of thousands. But Jesus also wandered into the wilderness, climbed up mountaintops, took stormy sea voyages just to get away from the noise and the needs of the crowds pressing in on him. And like Jesus, we all need to come apart so that we don't fall apart. So I thought about worship here and it's spiritual soundings and spiritual silence that come together. The holy hoopla and the holy hush are both part of our connection to the divine presence. The morning, this morning's story of Pentecost is a story of stunned, bewildered disciples who regrouped, who waited for the spirit and when the Spirit came, were able to speak. Who knows what the disciples envisioned that the promised Spirit would bring them? Perhaps they hoped for superhero powers. Perhaps they dreamed of a perpetual presence of cherubim and seraphim sitting around on the clouds, singing and playing harps, or some other heavenly creature. And perhaps they prayed for some sort of militarization because, after all, they thought the Christ was going to come as a military leader, as a king. So what is it that the disciples finally got and that we finally got? The wind blew and the big gift was the Holy Spirit, and that big gift came with other gifts. On that day of Pentecost, Jesus' disciples received the gift of sound and the wind blew and the gift of silence in the presence of the dove. First, this was a sound that filled the house in which they were gathered. Have you ever been in a small space where everybody's talking at the same time? That the noise level increases because you're trying to be heard over everybody else? That kind of sound, after a while, starts to invade who we are. 
And it has to go somewhere. Like on Pentecost when the sound poured forth, but it wasn't soldiers or weaponry or military might. It took the form of language with everybody speaking in different words. Some people call this glossolalia. I just think that the Spirit made it possible. Glossolalia is when you speak in tongues. That's why the word is so hard to say. I think what it meant is that no matter what language people spoke, you were able to understand them. The first time since the Tower of Babel that people could understand one another. And that's the gift given to us too. And despite all the rush of the wind, there was a clear and present hush that was also gifted to us. There was the hushing of the disciples' anxieties. When we are torn apart with worry and concern, it is Christ's spirit that brings us centered back to God. There was the hushing of the petty personal agendas that still drove these disciples. They were called by God, but they weren't perfect in any sense of the imagination. There was the hushing of doubt, filled to overflowing, but blown over by the rush of a Holy Spirit so loud and exuberant, it attracted the attention of the crowds. The healing hushing of the Spirit became a rush of new wisdom that poured out on these timid disciples and spoke forth in language that all could hear. I want to try an experiment. I would like all of you to think of a one-line prayer that you can repeat over and over again. Like, Lord, have mercy, or bring healing God, or anything like that. You got one? You really need one. Got it? Now, on the count of three, I want you all to speak your prayer out loud at the same time. This is how it would have been at Pentecost then. Got your prayer? One, two, three. Lord bless this congregation. Make Lord bless. No, 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 no. Keep over and over and over. You are a crowd filled with the Spirit. Let's go with your prayers. Lord bless this congregation. Lord bless this congregation. Lord bless. Choir ought to be the loudest. Come on, kids. We need your spirit to get it up and going. You see what happens when we're self-conscious? You see what happens when we stop to think about what we're doing instead of what God is doing in us? It makes a big difference. And so the rush becomes the hush. The hush healing. The spirit healing. It is difficult for most white Americans to enter into worship in a way that gets outside of ourselves because we are so darn worried. What will somebody say? What will somebody think? Now, those of you who are married or close in couples, spread apart a little bit, please. We got one more coming. Hmm. Now, to the person next to you, not your mate, say, what's the rush? Come on. The rush? And the person that was spoken to say, the holy hush. One more time. What's the rush? The holy hush. The two things are part of the same. They're not separate. They're not different. They're not apart. They are the same Holy Spirit. The rush and the hush 
were given to the disciples on Pentecost, but they were also given to us. And in Scripture, the parting of the Red Sea, the breath that raised the dry bones, the power that blew the trumpets and brought down the walls of Jericho, combined with the still small voice, the nine-month silence of Zechariah, the private mountaintop meditations of Jesus, the rush and the hush. God's second temple, the church, This living organism, whether you see yourself that way or not, is fueled by the power of the Holy Spirit, given breath by the power of the Holy Spirit, and given the strength and the wherewithal to be in ministry in the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. This silence and sound has been a part of Christianity since Jesus' birth, and especially since the birth of the church on Pentecost. It is a way of understanding God that goes across cultures, goes across nations, goes across individual churches. And so the hush and the rush is what we have in common with one another. Here is the promise of Pentecost. See if it's a promise you can live with. Rush hour can be hush hour if we let the Holy Spirit in. Those of you who get a little agitated during rush hour know exactly what I'm talking about. Family frenzy can become family fun if we let the Holy Spirit in. That's probably one of the harder ones. Deadlines can become creative lifelines if we let the Holy Spirit in. Offline, out of service, not responding, annoying electronic glitches can become new line, quality service, always respond, personal commitments, if we let the Holy Spirit in. Believe it or not, it really does matter how you treat the people you call about a problem. And honey does get a whole lot more than vinegar. So the disciples waiting for a miracle receive a sound that becomes silence, a holy rush that becomes a holy hush, a brassy, brazen message that is at the same time a calm, delicate mystery. Christians, go forth from this place and share that heart-stopping rush of your faith and nurture it with the heart calming mystery of your hearts. And the wind blew, and the dove descended, and the people said, Alleluia and Amen. People, Alleluia and Amen.